In the early hours of June 26th, 1776, eight men, Moses, Joe, Billy, Postilion Tom, Mulatto Peter, Tom Pantico, Manuel, and Lancaster Sam, armed themselves and escaped from their captivity at Sabine Hall in Richmond County, Virginia, where a man named Landon Carter had enslaved them. We do not know their planned destination, but Landon felt certain that they were seeking out Lord Dunmore, Virginia's deposed royal governor, who had promised freedom to any able-bodied enslaved man willing to fight for the British. Landon was a patriot, a supporter of American independence, but the escape of these eight men had brought the revolution to his doorstep in a way that he was ill-prepared to handle. A bit about Landon Carter, and why we know so much about him. Colonel Landon Carter, a title he went by as that was his rank in the local militia, was a tobacco planter and slaveholder who was among the wealthiest men in the colony of Virginia. Across several properties, he held more than 400 men, women, and children in bondage. He was an enthusiastic amateur scientist and physician. He threw his lot in with the Patriots as tension rose with Great Britain. We know a great deal about Landon Carter because of his diary, a remarkable document. The diary covered the daily operation of Sabine Hall, his experiments with agriculture and medicine, his career in politics, his dreams, his feuds with his neighbors, and his struggles to assert dominance over his family and the hundreds he enslaved. Through it, we can follow Virginia's path to revolution. We can also, less directly, learn about the lives of enslaved people in Virginia. Using this diary, we're going to try to reconstruct what Landon's world looked like before the American Revolution, and what did and did not change when revolution came. We'll also attempt to reconstruct the lives of some of the eight who escaped Landon. Throughout, I'll be putting quotes from the diary up on these slides. Today we'll do our best to understand the myths that Landon and the people he enslaved believed in. Now when I say myth, I'm not referring to stories that are not true. I'm describing stories that are the basis for all truth, foundational narratives that express the most central values of a society and teach listeners how to interact with the world. Understanding these myths can tell us a great deal about why people think and act in the way that they do. It can help us see the shape of the mental universe that the people of the past lived in. Let's start with Landon. Now, by the 19th century, one of the exceptional features of slavery in the Americas is that it's a central institution of nominally egalitarian democratic societies like the United States. But in 1770, the world was a very different place. In a way, Landon stood astride two very different worlds. He still lived in a world where all people occupied a place on the Great Chain of Being. The Great Chain of Being was, by 1770, a very old but still powerful concept. It understood all creatures as occupying rungs on a hierarchical ladder, stretching from the lowliest being all the way up to God. Everybody had their proper place, and it was always above and below someone else. The occupants of each rung had duties and obligations to those above and below them. Everything existed in a hierarchical relationship legitimized by God, the only being over whom no one sat. This is a view of the world that is actively hostile to equality as stability depends on everyone remaining conscious of their place and the duties associated with that place. Landon thus expected obedience and deference from all those who were beneath him. Most 18th century Virginian elites understood the world in very similar terms. A central myth for men like Landon, Christians who subscribed to this view of the world, was that of the Garden of Eden. 
where Eve and Adam had cursed humanity forever by sinfully disobeying the Father God. It's not hard for us to see how a person who views human affairs through this lens could justify their exploitation of enslaved labor, but the great chain of being touched more than that. Landon believed that the chain of obligation, duty, and deference extended to his family as well. The ideal 18th century British father was a stern, cold authoritarian. Ever conscious of his duty, he directed the lives and choices of his children, who gratefully obeyed. The feelings of his children were largely irrelevant, lower on the chain as they were. Landon's father, Robert King Carter, had modeled this form of fatherhood to his sons. Holding more than one million acres of land and 1,000 people in slavery at the time of his death, he was an exemplary manager of plantations and was keen to see his heirs follow in his footsteps. In a letter to a friend, Robert explained one of his labor management strategies. If an enslaved worker proved particularly troublesome, through frequent thefts, absences, insubordination, or some combination of these, Robert mutilated that person, cutting the toes from one foot in front of the rest of the plantation's enslaved community, thereby setting an example. Robert proudly insisted that he had, quote, cured many a Negro of running away by this means. Such were the measures used to maintain absolute patriarchal authority. Landon might have hoped to mimic his father, and that his own children would mimic him, but to his great distress he found that his children were decidedly less enthusiastic about this arrangement than he was. Landon's son, also named Robert, drank, gambled, abused his wife, and scorned all his father's wisdom and advice. Landon's youngest daughter, Judith, against her father's wishes, married a man he hated. This is what Landon called his son-in-law, Reuben Beale, whenever he appeared in the diary. I'm serious. Every single time. He exiled Judith from his home after her marriage in 1772, and it took years for them to reconcile. Perhaps even worse... Robert was raising grandchildren that mimicked their father, paying no heed to their duties and disrespecting their elders. Of course, grouchy old men have always complained about the young people. But Landon may have been on to something, for new attitudes, disseminated in new literature, were reshaping how people like Judith thought about parents and children. If you've studied American history, you may already be familiar with the 18th century's consumer revolution. As newly affordable and newly plentiful consumer goods flooded the Anglo-American world, ordinary people, provided they had money, could purchase refinement and higher status for themselves in a way that they could not before. We might think of this as a bit of rust on the great chain of being. Not exactly destroying it, but making it a little weaker. Printing became cheaper, and people who might once have only owned two books in their lives, the Bible and the Book of Common Prayer, began to purchase and read novels. One of the most popular of this new kind of book was the sentimental novel. Its stories were not set in the traditional hierarchical universe where to live properly was to do your duty in the station to which God had called you. Instead, they told stories in which a female protagonist, vexed by a stern authoritarian father and guided by love, not duty, follows her heart on a journey of romance and self-actualization. She might marry against her father's will, but in the end they'd lovingly reconcile, having both learned and grown. In the more tragic tellings, a father might exile his daughter for her disobedience, leading to her death and the father's mournful realization of his error. The ethos of these novels was far removed from cold duty, and Landon read them just as his children did. <laughs> 
that might help to explain why Judith's exile seemed to eat away at Landon so much. Here, Landon has a bad dream two years after expelling his daughter from his house. She appears to him dressed in mourning, begging his forgiveness and showing the proper contrition of an undutiful daughter. Landon mused the next morning about what it would take to forgive Judith, hoping he might have a chance to. Eventually, desperate for her affection, Landon reached out to her, when by all rights she should have reached out to him, and offered to forgive her. A warm and tender moment, perhaps, but Landon remained troubled, directing an entry in his journal to God and writing that, he had, quote, suffered himself to destroy thy divine order governing the world. His need to be loved had won out, but Landon was conscious of the chip he had made in the great chain around which he built his sense of self. Landon prided himself on his identity as a good master who saw to the needs of his people as he demanded their obedience. This included acting as the plantation's physician, and though some of the results of his cutting-edge 18th century medicine may appear ghastly to us today, they reveal much about how Landon believed the universe was and ought to be ordered. In many ways, European medicine had not changed much in thousands of years. Like his ancient predecessors, Landon believed that health was dependent on keeping the body's components in balance. Illness resulted from imbalance, an excess or want of some element like blood or phlegm. Educated 18th century healers used the strategies of heroic medicine. Bleedings, like the one depicted on this slide, diuretics, purgatives, vomits, laxatives, enemas, and so on, to maintain this balance. Grisly and ineffective as these techniques appear to us, Landon also had a practical knowledge of the human body that made him a reasonably effective healer when it came to physical trauma. In Landon's medical writings, we find the most vivid mentions of Tom Panico, one of the eight who liberated themselves. In the autumn of 1772, Tom was working at Sabine Hall's Tobacco House, where bundles of harvested leaves were hung on rows and rows of rafters to air dry and cure. While hanging a bundle, Tom fell and impaled his leg on one of the sharp stakes placed in the ground. This was one of the many perils enslaved workers navigated as they brought in and processed each year's harvest. Though a local physician feared loss of limb or even life, Landon cleaned and bound the wound such as to save the leg within a few days. Landon proudly noted dozens of such cases, each one vindicating his identity as a good master. But what Landon thought of as benevolence often looks very different to us. Tom Panico's injured leg was not the only issue that drew his owner's eye and medical interest. He also suffered from what looked to Landon like the Great Pox, a sexually transmitted disease. Landon was thrilled at the chance to test out a remedy he had read about, and he also took the opportunity to lecture Tom about his sexual morality in relationship to his wife Nellie. Landon felt he was entitled to meddle in all the intimate matters of his people. For people enslaved in the Americas, establishing spaces where their owner's eyes could not penetrate was often a high priority. The barest minimums of privacy had to be fought for. Tom does not speak to us directly, but perhaps reclaiming a dignity that such intrusions from Landon had violated was part of his motivation to escape. It's also possible that Sabine Hall's enslaved community had their own preferred healers with their own methods. Though men like Landon tried to force the people they enslaved to depend on them for all things, Modified forms of traditional African medical practices persisted throughout the 18th century and beyond. They combined a practical knowledge of the human body and the effects of various medicines with a devotional vocabulary that implored supernatural figures for aid. 
Landon, who always showed proper deference to the Father God and prayed for his help, had much in common with them. While some slaveholders called on the services of enslaved healers, even for their own families, for Landon, medicine was another way of asserting his authority over those he called his dependents, and he scorned black healers as conjurers. It is no coincidence that Landon described the makeup of a person's body as their constitution and referred to diseased flesh as corrupted. 18th century thinkers constantly deployed bodily metaphors to describe the proper organization of society. This image, the cover of Thomas Hobbes's famous work of 17th century political philosophy, The Leviathan, depicts all the people of a state contained within the physical body of their king. This was a metaphor familiar to any 18th century European thinker. All components in balance to make sure things operated smoothly. An imbalance, a king with too much arbitrary power, a people too presumptuous in their demands, spelled disaster for a society just as it doomed human bodies. In 1758, Landon's daughter Susanna grew sick, and Landon, too anxious to treat her himself, gave her over to the care of a local physician, who proceeded to slowly kill her with the same purges, vomits, and sweats that Landon no doubt would have employed. However stern and aloof his paternal affection may have been in life, his grief was overpowering when she died. He composed this bit of verse in his diary shortly after he reported her death, mourning for the life she could have had. 18th century poetry reads as pretty stuffy to us today, but even in the confines of that style his grief is palpable. In this stark moment of anguish and heartbreak, we can learn something more of Landon's view of the universe and his place in it. Landon did not rage against a god who would be so cruel as to take his favorite child. Instead, he thanked his father god for blessing him, however briefly, with a child as perfectly virtuous as his beloved Susanna. He told the father god that he understood how much of a blessing his daughter had been, and hoped it was some sign that the heavenly patriarch did not think him altogether corrupt though far be it for him to assume as much. Landon was well aware of his place on the great chain of being, and he always dutifully deferred to his superiors. In a typical year at Sabine Hall, about a hundred enslaved workers worked on the plantation's 350 cleared acres to cultivate approximately 250,000 tobacco plants, 300,000 corn plants, and on the rest of the property, a mixture of wheat, oats, barley, peas, beans, turnips, and other soil-replenishing fodder crops. Farming is hard work no matter where or when you are but tobacco was a particularly labor-intensive crop, comparable to the sugar grown in the Caribbean, though not with the sugar colony's appalling death rates. I have on this slide a fictionalized depiction of George Washington on his own plantation in Fairfax County, Virginia. And that's because Washington, like Carter, was a thorough and detail-oriented micromanager of plantation affairs an attentiveness not welcomed by the people he enslaved. Landon was a keen observer of each year's agricultural cycle, making copious notes about the weather, the progress of various projects, and the labor and behavior of the people he enslaved. It's through these observations that we get much of the direct literary evidence covering the lives of the eight men who escaped him, and a particularly detailed picture of what historians call Quotidian resistance. Quotidian resistance is a term for the daily, often covert, ways that enslaved people resisted their enslavement. The forms this resistance took included work slowdowns, playing dumb, faking sick, theft, temporary absence, sabotage, and arson. 
This 19th century image on the slide depicts a few enslaved men sharing a bottle of liquor as they grapple with hogs and fowl stolen from their owners. It's theft, temporary absence, and likely some dissembling and playing dumb once they get back. They resorted to these methods because more overt forms of resistance, such as long-term absences, actively fighting back, or murder, were punished extremely harshly. Virginia was still a place where the courts sentenced slaves to be burned alive, still a place where the heads of rebellious slaves were placed on stakes beside crossroads. In the absence of other means, and with overt resistance almost certain to result in painful death, enslaved people in colonial Virginia used covert quotidian resistance to make their displeasure felt, to disrupt their enslavers' plans, and to wring concessions from them. Even though these acts often occurred out of view, and few took credit for them when prompted, both Landon and the people he enslaved knew that this was a regular aspect of daily life. As Landon contested with sabotages and thefts real and imagined, the people he enslaved had to contend with his suspicions and enraged reactions. Of the eight who escaped Landon in 1776, Manuel was the most well-documented, having labored at Sabine Hall for more than 20 years before claiming his freedom. His fraught relationship with Landon serves as an excellent model for what resistance looked like before the Revolution, and the constant tension that shaped life on a plantation. Landon fluctuated between admiration for Manuel's skill, noting approvingly in 1774 that the plowman had performed his labors above and beyond expectations, and furious denunciations of what Landon saw as Manuel's malevolent sabotage. Writing in 1770, after the death of several oxen under Manuel's care, that the man had, quote, at last completed every scheme that he might have in hand to ruin me. One day, Manuel complained to Landon that this year he had to plow twice as large an area as last year. Landon showed him the measurements that indicated that he only had to plow one and a third times as much land, and the two men shared a good laugh. Maybe you had to be there. Landon was convinced that Manuel had stolen and sold feed intended for livestock so that he could buy liquor. He was near certain that Manuel's daughter Sarah had escaped her confinement in a locked shed, where Landon had imprisoned her as punishment for running away, with Manuel's assistance. Rage, paranoia, and accusations without hard evidence typified Landon's reaction to these rebellions, something he had in common with other slaveholders. Though the anonymous nature of quotidian resistance provided some safety, Landon was empowered to inflict violence on the people he enslaved with impunity. When Manuel accidentally drove an ox cart into a ditch in 1770, Landon ordered him whip. When Sarah escaped her confinement, Landon ordered whippings for both father and daughter. When he suspected Manuel of another theft, he dragged him to the county courthouse, got an order for his hanging, and only intervened in the last moment when Manuel stood on the scaffold with a noose around his neck. Landon meant for the last incident to be a lesson to the recalcitrant worker, though we need not be surprised that Manuel did not react to this chastening with a grateful newfound resolve to be more attentive to his duties. Manuel's family and other members of Sabine Hall's enslaved community often ran away, but they almost always returned after at most a few months of hiding out in nearby woods or plantation outbuildings. With no free north to run to, all thirteen colonies had slavery. Absenting oneself was often a negotiation tactic. Should Landon impose an unacceptable new demand or commit a truly egregious abuse, running away served to chasten him, as, whatever his power, his well-being was still wholly dependent on the labor of his slaves. Landon, like other slaveholders, 
occasionally granted concessions to people who had absented themselves, even as he ordered brutal punishments on their returns. This was the anxious, tension-filled equilibrium under which slaveholders and enslaved people lived. Until the Revolution. The British were not stupid. The last royal governor of Virginia, Lord Dunmore, had threatened rowdy patriot colonists with the specter of slave rebellion even before the outbreak of open hostilities. He knew as well as his Virginian subjects that the 40% of Virginia's population held in slavery was a critical vulnerability. The capital city of Williamsburg, where Dunmore lived until 1775, had a population that was 52% enslaved. Some areas of Virginia had even more skewed demographics, and the British, who had no objections to slavery, saw an opportunity. Thus, shortly after Lord Dunmore fled Williamsburg with his family in 1775, he issued his proclamation, offering freedom to any enslaved man of fighting age willing to flee a rebel owner and fight for the British. Getting to Lord Dunmore was difficult. His ship was somewhere down in Norfolk, the lower circle, and almost all of the land between Norfolk and Richmond County, the upper circle, had been cleared for tobacco cultivation. In fact, squint a little closer at this map. Notice that it gets less and less detailed as we look further west, because British settlement across the Appalachians was still sparse. The coastal tidewater region, where Sabine Hall lay, is mapped in exquisite, accurate detail. Anyone hunting liberated slaves in this region would know the land well. Even if you successfully reached Dunmore, you couldn't know he'd keep his promise. Yet that promise had changed the nature of everything. More than ever, escape could mean permanent freedom. Wars make chaos. As Lord Dunmore issued his proclamation, white men all over Virginia rushed to enlist in the Continental Army or on local militias and committees of public safety. The men who had once staffed the slave patrols on Virginia's roads now had other duties. Elsewhere, the war offered potential freedom in different forms. At first, black soldiers fought for the British, like this historical interpreter dressed as a member of Lord Dunmore's Ethiopian Regiment. But in 1778, Rhode Island, distressed at the lack of enlistment into the Continental Army, offered enslaved men their freedom if they fought for the new nation. Shortly after the war's end, the new state began the process of gradual emancipation. In 1781, the British, invading and occupying Virginia, extended the terms of Lord Dunmore's offer to any enslaved person, regardless of age, gender, or willingness to fight. These opportunities entailed significant risks and uncertain rewards, but over the course of the war, Historians estimate that between 30 and 100,000 people escaped slavery. Landon had not anticipated this, and struggled to process its meaning. In July of 1776, as he made note of each and every rumor regarding escaped slaves in the area, Landon encountered the Absinate once more, this time in his dreams. They begged Landon's forgiveness for their terrible dereliction of duty, describing their great sorrow as they found themselves filthy and starving in their newfound freedom, confirming Landon's suspicions that Moses persuaded them off and that he had not a greater villain belonging to me. Was Landon aware of how similar this dream was to the one he'd had about his estranged daughter? In both dreams, Landon's wayward dependents had mournfully vindicated him as they abased themselves. So why did he awake from both feeling so uneasy? Weeks after the dissemination of the Declaration of Independence, and its assertion that all men are created equal, 
Landon could not and would not accept that his slaveholding was in any way illegitimate, but he could not and would not sleep easily either. What primed Landon to believe that Moses acted as a ringleader? To answer that question, we need to return to the question of myths and the stories told among members of Sabine Hall's enslaved community. These were the myths of a Creole people. Creolization is a term that historians use to describe the formation of new cultures in the new world from the collisions of old ones. When I say culture, I'm referring to a body of beliefs and values, socially acquired and patterned, that serve a society as guides of and for behavior. In comparison to the people they enslaved, European colonists came from a relatively homogenous cultural background. Not so for their captives. The people enslaved at Sabine Hall may have been or been descended from Akan people, Igbo people, Yoruba people, Sierra Leoneans, Senegambians, and more, each ethnicity encompassing myriad separate cultures, beliefs, and practices. Captive Africans on slave ships carried certain languages, beliefs, attitudes, cognitive habits, and cultural forms with them, but they could not preserve the cultures of their homelands because they could not take institutions with them through the disorienting nightmare of the Middle Passage. Priests may have made the Atlantic crossing, but not priesthoods, kings, but not monarchies, scholars, but not schools. Instead, in circumstances not of their choosing, they developed new cultures with new vocabularies and new foundational myths, drawing on African, European, and Native American antecedents. Anansi the Spider, an Akan folk hero who could always outwit his bigger, stronger foes, taught enslaved children how to survive and provided much-needed emotional catharsis when he humiliated the powerful. Enslaved people in Virginia might hold Baptist funerals for the dead and use the fresh soil from their graves to predict the future, just as some of their ancestors did in West and Central Africa. Many of the people enslaved in Virginia had been born in Africa. Many more would spend their lives refusing to accept the religion of their enslavers. But by the late 18th century, in part swept along by the wave of religious enthusiasm called the Great Awakening, increasing numbers of enslaved people had converted to Christianity and were making it their own. Could it be that for the Christians Landon enslaved, the exodus out of Egypt served as a foundational myth? The enslaved community at Sabine Hall in 1776 offers us no direct testimony, but in 1862, newly freed people working in a Union Army military camp sang, The Lord by Moses to Pharaoh said, O oh, let my people go. If not, I'll smite your firstborn dead, O oh, let my people go. O oh, go down, Moses, away down to Egypt's land, and tell King Pharaoh to let my people go. We know little of Moses. He appeared infrequently in Landon's diary, labored as an attendant or footman to both Landon and Landon's son, Robert. Is it possible that Moses was self-consciously enacting this myth when he led seven other men from their own Egypt? Beyond the absence of direct testimony, we cannot even know that Moses was a practicing Christian. His name may have been one chosen by his parents but it just as easily could have been imposed by an owner. It may be that Landon made a connection that Moses never did when he blamed him for leading the Exodus. With all that we know of Landon so far, it might surprise us that he threw his lot in with other patriots in rebellion against the father king, George III. He had little sympathy for the sorts of people who might express their grievances with vandalism or mob violence, 
and certainly did not wish to endorse the social leveling such protests implied. Even the restrained elite radicalism of men like Patrick Henry held little appeal to the colonel during the Stamp Act crisis. In April of 1776, Landon, as unhappy with the Stamp Act as most of his fellow planters, published a letter in the colony's newspaper expressing his hope that King George III would dismiss his evil counselors and, quote, be ever happy in the dutiful allegiance of his people, and that his faithful subjects may be equally blessed with his royal protection. Landon refused to participate in the boycott of British goods led by patriot radicals like Henry in 1766. Landon had enough rebellions at home to deal with. He may have had that in mind throughout his early moderation. There isn't much in the way of an identifiable transformation in Landon's worldview that may have prompted him to throw in with the Patriots. Right up through 1776, he remained equally hostile to the king's evil counselors and the radical Patriots like Patrick Henry or Thomas Paine. But in 1774, after years of rising tension, Landon found himself swept up in events not of his making. After the destruction of the tea in Boston Harbor, Landon looked on with, quote, great alarms as the Crown blockaded and occupied the city of Boston. Landon had no choice but to conclude that the port's closure was, quote, but a prelude to destroy the liberties of America. He had to act. This time, he enthusiastically assented to a boycott of British goods and encouraged his neighbors to do the same. He gave speeches at his local county court to persuade his neighbors that they must show solidarity with Boston or themselves face tyranny. Yet even if political defiance and armed resistance were now necessary, Landon still hoped for reconciliation with his distant father and did his best to moderate the radicalism around him and to avoid mob rule. When, in the spring of 1775, Virginian men began to form independent militia companies, which were entirely too democratic and egalitarian for Landon's liking, they elected their own officers. He helped to replace them with standardized Minutemen companies, led by appointed officers who he could be assured were men of sufficient quality and rank. In March of 1776, he spoke scornfully of the talk of independency. Still hoping to reconcile with his father king, Landon asserted that independence advocates all spoke with the toxic, radical voice of Mr. Common Sense. Thomas Paine. Like many of his elite patriot contemporaries, Landon feared that the democratic impulse behind independent militia companies, Bostonian mob violence, and Paine's anti-monarchical sentiment were merely the pretense through which demagogues would impose an even more terrible tyranny. There seemed to be no good options for the old colonel who was confronted with the abuses and excesses of royal authority when he turned from his condemnation of the democratic spirit around him. Perhaps recognizing that he could do little to stem the tide, Landon wrote on April 13, 1776, that, quote, If our form of government is changed, I hope some divine inspiration will possess our rulers to establish the common law of England amongst us. He could not accept the novel conceptions of governance, social relations, and the proper ordering of the world that sprung up around him, nor could he accept the loss of his cherished liberties to a tyrannical monarch. Independence and war finally came. Eight men claimed their freedom from Sabine Hall, and Landon died in 1778 thoroughly unhappy with the new world that surrounded him. One of his last diary entries, from July 10, 1777, was a lengthy rehearsal of all the good he had done for the ape, a vindication of Landon's legitimate authority, a condemnation of the ape's ingratitude. I'll end with one last quote from Landon. Here, in an entry that he hoped the rest of his family would read, 
He made the case for himself as a father well deserving of their love and terribly hurt by their cruel ingratitude. A patriarch of old would have been unlikely to make such a plea for understanding, but Landon lived astride two worlds. He wanted obedience and love in equal measure, an impossible demand. He despised tyranny and defended his rights, yet was tyrant to hundreds whose rights he denied. When Landon died, he left behind a world struggling with the potential of radical change. The revolution had promoted egalitarian, democratic ideas that terrified the grumpy old man. The actual war had brought rebellion to his own doorstep and cast him in the role of King George III. The old way, the right way, seemed to be crumbling around him, replaced by something new and terrible. But Landon was not the only elite to struggle against the democratic tide, and many of his contemporaries were more successful than he in tamping down the radical spirit that threatened to upset the proper order of things. That's for a different lecture, though. Thanks for listening.